month reprieve in energy prices, these bills will not go away. Would the Chancellor have the mosque close their elderly daycare service or the counselling provision, the mother and toddler group, the poverty reduction work or the vaccination centre that has been running in the community hall? These are very real choices communities are already having to make. The businesses I have been listening to over the past months are incredibly worried for the future. They were already facing severe pressure through supply chain costs, input costs, labour costs, <laughs> COVID debts and Brexit woes before energy prices soared. Now they don't know how they will survive. Six months will go by in a flash and the question remains, what then? What then from the Chancellor? Companies can't wash away, wish away these bills. The eye-wateringly eye unaffordable contracts they are being forced to sign right now. What happens to those businesses who just miss the arbitrary cut-off? And what of the increase in standing charges, which we already know are disproportionately high in Scotland? Mr Speaker, Scotland is an energy-rich country, but we don't have the power. Scotland's renewable sector is booming, but in off-gas grid rural Scotland, surrounded by the wind turbines generating clean green energy, people are having to spend an absolute fortune in heating oil. In Argyll and Butte, in Angus, the Highlands and Islands and across our rural communities, households face increases of over 230 per cent in the past two years alone. The UK Government's offer of £100 is nothing short of an insult as people turn to credit cards to fill up their fuel tanks. The Scottish Government is doing all in its power to support people through this crisis, strengthening the safety net by increasing the Scottish child payment to £25 a week, doubling the fuel insecurity fund to £20 million and freezing rents because renters are also facing pressures. We have the highest rate of the real living wage in Scotland. We have invested in tackling fuel poverty and energy efficiency. But we could do so much more with more budget and more powers. At the back of the Blue Book today, still no carbon capture and storage for the north east of Scotland, a game changer for renewables in Scotland. Where is that in the Chancellor's plans? Nowhere again. We could have growth by investing in skills, in net zero and productivity. The Chancellor's plans will not do this. Mr. Speaker, people don't freeze to death in our Nordic neighbours. And people there are not living in one of the most unequal countries in the world, yeah, yeah. and it's only getting worse. Yeah. This right-wing, Thatcher-cause-playing shambles of a government yeah, is making choices yeah, yeah, yeah. that they will never feel the consequences of. Mr Speaker, I beg of this Chancellor to listen to those on the edge, those who are desperately looking right now to him for a lifeline, but no one should have to beg for a decent standard of living. The people of Scotland see a Scottish Government doing their best to mitigate the worst, but stymied by the broken politics of this union and this economic madness we heard from the Chancellor today. Scotland is looking for a different path, Mr Speaker. Scotland needs independence. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what Scotland doesn't need is reheated socialism from the yeah. SNP. Uh, she mentioned energy, and I was just, I'm always staggered when uh, people on, in her party mention energy, yeah. and they don't countenance nuclear power. Nuclear power is a great, clean form of energy. And, it's, and while we speak about energy, she will know that we have indeed listened. We have uh, implemented a, a limit uh, to energy prices. My uh, right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, who is no longer in her place, made uh, the, in, uh, the engagement within two days of uh, taking office, and it's something which I'm very proud of, and we've also extended it to supporting businesses. In fairness, the spokesman for the SNP was heard in silence by members on this side. I certainly expect the answer to be heard in silence, and especially as it affects the constituencies concerned. Chancellor of the Exchequer. And I was very surprised to hear her mention energy, given mm. the SNP's appalling record uh, in that regard. Yes. I'm, very, I'm, I'm, I'm very open. Uh, to her ideas, but I would very much recommend that she pursues nuclear power, which has a, got a great tradition in yeah, Scotland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Byrne. Mr Speaker, I very much welcome the aspirations for growth, and all governments, all Conservative uh, chancellors, uh, should have their minds focused on sustainable growth. I welcome the measures on EIS and SEIS, which were planned I note the economic logic behind the banker's bonus cap change, but what I would say is that in my four and a half years as City Minister, the biggest concern that banks had was for the overall tax burden. 
and I would urge him to keep a focus on the global competitiveness of that. But the final point I would like to make is in an era of grave uncertainty around inflation, there is a clear concern in the markets around the irreconcilable realities of monetary tightening at the same time as fiscal loosening. And I would welcome the Chancellor's observations and reassurance to the markets at this time. In terms, in terms, in terms of the two points he made, he's absolutely right to say bankers are concerned about the overall tax burden. And that's why, that's why many of the bankers in the City of London are going to Paris, because they're, being pay they're paying 30 per cent tax there. That's a legitimate thing, and that's why we've reduced that's why we've reduced uh, tax uh, levels. With respect to monetary and fiscal policy, he will know that monetary policy is the responsibility of the bank and monetary policy is targeted on inflation. And the fiscal policy that we've, uh, fiscal course that we've charted has, 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 has absorbed two exogenous shocks in the form of COVID-19 and the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And it is entirely appropriate in both those circumstances to have a looser fiscal policy to steer uh, our path through those shocks. There's entire logic uh, to those positions. Yeah. Yeah. Dave Angela Riedel. <coughs> Chancellor, uh, without giving us uh, any sign of the figures, has um, had a budget now, uh, had has announced what is in effect a budget yes. with massive tax cuts, most of which go to um, those who are already well off. And he has asserted, Mr Speaker, that this will lead to growth. But he must now admit that there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that large tax cuts for the already well off uh, actually lead to growth. In fact, the IMF has said the opposite. Yeah. 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 In, in response to that, I would say that there is plenty of evidence that high tax, high regulation socialism leads to a complete disaster where, as far as economic outcomes are concerned. And we are doing the opposite. Andrew Lett, Dave Angela. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I commend my right honourable friend for the incredibly broad package of support for all those who are faced with massive energy bills right now? And does he share my concern? that members opposite are talking down the size of that package, and that in itself is causing grave concern amongst pensioners and families who are not therefore understanding that actually help is on its way and that the government has sought to deal with that very grave concern. I am very grateful to my right hon. Friend for pointing out that the scale of the intervention is unprecedented and millions and millions of people and businesses will be helped by what the government is doing. I'd like to thank her very much for that. John McDonnell. The cut of the 45p rate benefits the richest 1% in our society. Combined with lifting the cap on bonuses and his attack on those on universal credit. Does he not realise that this is the most socially divisive budget in a generation? And has he not looked at history of engineered booms of this sort, which in the 1960s, the dash for growth created catastrophe in our economy, the barber boom of the 70s created unemployment, and the Lawson boom eventually created chaos? The only benefit which each of those three engineered booms resulted in the fall of, of a Tory government. Yeah. All I remember was the financial crash of 2008, which his own party oh, yeah. presided that, over and, and managed, and managed uh, to engineer. The other point I would mention, the other point I would mention, is that the 40p rate was the rate for 20 years, and it was actually the rate that adopted by his party when they were successful and they used to win elections. John Redwood. I strongly welcome the growth plan and the tax cuts that will help deliver it. And, 
And does he agree with me that there are more obstacles to be swept aside so that we can grow more of our own food, produce more of our own energy, supply more of our own goods, to raise the living standards, generate the better jobs that we all want? As so often, my right honourable friend is 100% right. Sarah Olney. Very much, Mr. Speaker. This Conservative government is completely out of touch. Today, we have witnessed the biggest and most irresponsible increase in borrowing in recent times. Borrowing that could have been offset by increasing the windfall tax on oil and gas companies, but instead. This bill will be paid by millions of householders yeah. through higher taxes for years to come. And the Chancellor's excuse for this reckless approach is that it will lead to growth, which will supposedly trickle down as higher prosperity for the rest of us. So will the Chancellor explain to my constituents how handing £45 billion of their taxes to the UK's most profitable companies and the wealthiest individuals will help them to get a GP appointment when they need it, give their children a better education and make their streets safer? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So what the Honourable Lady... Uh, didn't mention in her question was the fact that a growing economy creates growing tax revenues which pay for public services. Her high tax approach, her high tax, high spend approach leads to a, a cycle of stagnation. We want to break free of that. Kevin Holland Ray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, growth and cutting your taxes are true Conservative principles. Yeah. So is balancing the books. By my calculations, the uh, deficit this year, based on his announcements, will be in the region of £250 billion. Pounds. Probably £150 billion. Pounds. That's certainly the evidence we got to the Treasury Select Committee yesterday. I'd be interested in his actual forecast if that's not the case. But can he confirm, as he seeks to balance the books in the future, because of course there will be a higher deficit either way on this announcement, he will not do so by cutting investment in the north, infrastructure investment in the north, whatever the outcome may be in terms of his likely growth path from here. So um, my honourable friend will know that through growth uh, we will get more tax uh, receipts which will actually, uh, over the medium term, reduce, uh, reduce certainly the net debt to GDP ratio. And that's 100% what we're focused on. And he's right that in the past we've uh, tended to reduce expenditure on capital projects, and we mustn't do that uh, in the future if we're to pursue our goals in terms of levelling up. Dame Margaret Hodge. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, we expect our government to implement policy based on evidence. And as a student of history, the Chancellor will be familiar with Anthony Barber's 1970 disastrous economic experiment. Same thing, low tax, deregulation, desperate quest for growth, and all that did was lead to the barber boom, followed by a big crash, three-day working week, and yep. it turned to bust. Yep. The Chancellor is risking all our livelihoods, yep. Yep. he's risking our economy, yep. and he's risking our public finances yep. on the altar of a discredited ideology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A tsunami of tax cuts and giveaways to 80,000 Conservative members who voted the, the uh, Prime Minister into office, and little for exactly. the 80% of Britons who are struggling yeah, yeah. and facing a Who'd tough, tough that? winter ahead is outrageous. Yeah. According to Einstein, Mr Speaker, insanity is trying to do the yeah. same thing yes. over and over and expecting different <laughs> results. My question to the Chancellor is this. Can he not see that his budget is madness? Yeah. <laughs> No, I think it's uh, perfectly sane to want to grow the British economy yeah. by creating incentives. And on the barber boom, I mean, she's, an, she's an, uh, a student of history. The barber boom was driven uh, very primarily by very, very loose monetary policy. Yeah. Uh, it was essentially a demand sort of pump priming experiment. This is the opposite of that. What we're trying to do is to create incentives and also look at supply side reform. Right. It's a completely different uh, model. Greg Hans. I congratulate uh, the Chancellor on the measures announced today and congratulate him personally as well on his new role, uh, particularly the cut in base rate, the abolition of the 45p rate, the stamp duty cut, uh, and also the return of tax free shopping uh, to visitors, which will be very much welcomed in central London. Could I ask him to look further at the seven year bonus deferral rules 
in financial services, which are actually amongst the most punitive in the world today? Absolutely. We, I will be um, updating the House on our measures uh, for the financial services to try and make sure that they become, as they have been in the past, a world-leading industry. Sammy Wilson. I think many people will be astounded at the reaction there has been today at the Chancellor's proposal to increase economic growth in the United Kingdom, which will increase standard of living, increase employment, help to raise revenue for public services and reduce the national debt. I only hope that the Brexit freedoms that he is talking about, once we are free of the Northern Ireland Protocol, will lead to investment zones and regulatory reform in Northern Ireland. But would the Chancellor consider two things to help working families? First of all, as far as um, childcare tax-free allowances are concerned, which would be an immense help for uh, working families, would he consider an increase in that? And since two-thirds of people in Northern Ireland rely on home heating oil, would he accept that £100 of an increase when there's been a 300 per cent increase in the price of heating oil is not acceptable? So, on, these, on those three issues, we're absolutely looking at the childcare issue, and I'm sure uh, colleagues, my cabinet, one of my cabinet colleagues will update the House on that. We're talking about uh, the heating oil uh, intervention. And on investment zones, we are very, very willing and eager to engage with Northern Ireland uh, colleagues and friends on working out how we can roll out investment zones uh, in Northern Ireland. Anthony Brown. I strongly welcome this uh, radical and generous package of measures to promote growth and provide support for households. And I also very much welcome the fact that we're positioning the Conservative Party as a low tax party. And I yeah. join my colleagues in welcoming the cuts to income tax and corporation tax and various other taxes. I also particularly welcome the cut to the most economically damaging of all taxes, which is stamp duty, which yeah, is seen yeah, as uh, yeah. reducing labour mobility, clogging up the housing market. That cut is welcome. But groups like the Institute of Fiscal Studies have called for the full abolition of stamp duty uh, to promote uh, economic growth. Will my friend, my honourable friend, the Chancellor, go even further and look at further cuts to stamp duty to reduce the economic damage it causes and the damage to households? My honourable friend, whose uh, policy prescriptions are always very interesting and, and, and very valuable, I've, I've only been in post two and a half weeks, so but I'll be very happy. I'd be very happy uh, to discuss with him how we can simplify. Uh, our tax system. Russian Nara Ali. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know that inflation is way off target, and today's announcement of 45 billion worth of tax cuts is going to make that worse, forcing the Bank of England to have to consistently continue to raise mortgage rates, and that's going to hammer homeowners and mortgage holders. The Chancellor hasn't published the OBR analysis. Isn't it time he does? And isn't the reason why he's not publishing it is because they reveal that he has broken the fiscal rules he voted for and will not achieve the growth target that he set himself. Yeah. As I reminded uh, my right honourable friend, the OBR, and I said in my statement, the OBR will uh, be coming up with a forecast uh, certainly before uh, the end of the calendar year. Uh, and I'm very, very interested uh, uh, to, to hear uh, and to see what they, they have to say. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, President Putin has weaponised the cost of energy against Western economies, and the measures announced today are very welcome in helping our constituents uh, with temporary support through this uh, terrible uh, time uh, of invasion. Will the Chancellor confirm that the measures he's announced today that uh, support business will also continue to incentivise investment in renewable energy in this country so that we can never allow Putin to weaponise energy against us again? My, my honourable friend makes an excellent point with regard to renewables. Yes. Uh, it's always uh, salutary to remind the House we've got 11, nearly 12 gigawatts of installed capacity of offshore wind, which makes us the second uh, only to China in terms of the offshore wind rollout. And there's no reason why we can't continue to lead the world uh, in renewables, particularly in offshore wind, uh, solar, and other forms of renewable power. Emma Harvey. Mr. Speaker, does the Chancellor agree with the former Bank of England rate setter Martin Wheel, who says that the government's approach could end in tears with a run on the pound? Yeah. What will end in tears is high taxes, high spend and very low growth. And that's what exactly the iron cycle that we're trying to break. Andrew Mitchell. I very much welcome what my right honourable friend has said 
uh, in, in respect of growth, about investment zones, which uh, he says will come to the West Midlands. I think that will be very helpful in levelling up in the yeah. West Midlands and the Birmingham area. Um, can I remind him of the importance of the UK investment in tackling international problems, whether it's pandemics, illegal migration or climate change? That's about British expertise, but it's also about British money. Can he confirm to the House that we are on track to restore what was a manifesto promise uh, of bringing back the 0.7 in 2024? Yeah. 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 We're always uh, looking at our manifesto commitments, and given, <laughs> and given, and given, our, given our leadership in this, I hope that we can come uh, to the 0.7 as soon as is practicable uh, and, and the finances, the public finances allow. Ben Lake. The Chancellor began his statement by stating that the government will be cutting everyone's energy bill by an average of £1,400. But there are concerns, of course, whether this will indeed be the case for households and businesses that are not connected to the mains gas grid. Some 74% of properties in Ceredigion depend on alternate fuels that will not be subject to the measures announced this week. Therefore, will there be further support for such households and businesses to ensure that they benefit in a similar way to those that are connected to the mains gas grid? Yeah, we're discussing uh, support for off-grid uh, uh, properties, people who rely on heating oil and other uh, forms of uh, energy, uh, and that's something which my honourable, my right honourable friend, the business secretary, energy secretary, uh, will be discussing as well, and will set forth in more detail uh, very soon. So, Jeremy Wright. Thank you very much, much, Mr Speaker. I welcome the short-term support on energy costs the Government is pursuing, and I welcome, too, the Government's focus on growth in the longer term. But would my right honourable friend agree that growth is dependent on confidence, confidence of businesses, but also confidence of households who spend on the products and services those businesses create? And would he also agree that that confidence will evaporate if people's costs on their mortgage increase further than the benefits that they gain from tax reductions. And will he do all he can to make sure that doesn't that and also reducing the tax burden. But he's quite right that there is a risk in respect of interest rates, and I'm speaking uh, to the Governor uh, regularly uh, to see what his views are on that. We're working closely together and we will be uh, we will be very focused on alleviating the burden on our constituents. George Howard. The Chancellor proclaimed the end of redistribution. Mm. Well, I listened very carefully, Mr Speaker, to the measures he announced, and it strikes me that they are redistributive yeah. exactly. measures. Yeah. 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 They re re redistribute away from those in the greatest yeah. need yeah. Yeah. to those in the least need. Yeah. 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 How, Mr Speaker, does the, in that context, how does he defend spending 10 billion pounds a year on the buy to let scheme which serves only to um, help those who don't need it to buy houses that they don't live in and serves no purpose whatsoever for those who end up renting them just in the statement on helping people there are measures in our statement across uh, the income scale uh, and we are very very focused not uh, on trying on growth so what I said was that we, we indulge in a fight on redistributing something which is small, which we should be trying to grow, and that's where our focus is. James Carflidge. I congratulate my right friend on his statement and his position. Um, he knows that to increase output, he needs there to be capacity in the labour market, and that is extremely tight. He will come under huge pressure for loosening immigration rules. Can I urge him instead, as he said, to focus on the economically inactive, to ensure that they get the support, because is it not the case that those who have been written off, yes, mild mental health anxiety and all the rest of it, if they get the right support, it is in their interest to get back to work and it is in the interest of their self-esteem? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My friend is absolutely right. There is a huge impetus, there is a huge pool of talent that needs to be brought into the labour market and every government, our government in particular, should be focused on trying to bring more people uh, into the labour market. Angus Brendan McNeill. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Chancellor is uh, midwife to profiteering by energy companies on the public's credit card. He's done very little, as my friend from Kerry Dignan said, about rural and island places uh, dependent on central heat and oil. People in my constituency in electricity are having a unit rate of 33 pence, while in London it's 29.6 pence, 10% higher. 
The standing charge is 51 pence in my constituency, 32 per cent in London, a staggering 60 per cent higher. And these are figures from E.ON yesterday. This UK government is a highwayman, absolutely mm. stealing from energy-rich Scotland. Yeah. It is a disgrace. Yeah, yeah. And this Chancellor should be, should be conduct himself far more fairly than he is. This is, as has been said, something for the rich and not for the deserving. Yeah. I reject that, and he will know that when I was Business, Energy and Industrial Secretary, uh, uh, Industrial Strategy Secretary, I was very focused on bringing the uh, renewable uh, pot for remote island wind. And we, we achieved uh, great things working together, and I hope that we can continue that dialogue now I am in this office. Richard Drax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome our honourable friend to his place? And how refreshing to hear some Conservative policies. Yeah. 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 Weymouth, Weymouth is talking with officials about the idea of an investment zone. We are entirely supportive, and we very much hope we get it. But what they ask for, if we do get it, that we get the infrastructure funding to go with it, for without that we will not attract the private investment that we need to create the prosperity and jobs. Okay. Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right. We're trying to link the investment zones, and we will link the investment zones, to infrastructure projects, because one without the other uh, is, doesn't, doesn't make sense. But I'd be very interested to talk to him about uh, Weymouth and about the opportunities for investment zones uh, in that area. In Magdalia. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, we've seen this Chancellor rip up fiscal responsibility, sack uh, the senior civil servant at the Treasury and mortgage our children's and our country's future. Yeah. And it's not just me that's concerned about his uh, ambition for growth. The Institute for Fiscal Studies yeah. tells us that we shouldn't underestimate the scale of the challenge. I hope they don't know anyone does that. An increase in annual growth of more than 0.7% of national income the increase required just to stabilise debt as a share of GDP would be equivalent to the difference between the growth in the UK experienced in the 25 years from 1983. There is no miracle cure, they say. There is not. Can the Chancellor just admit that he's fiscally irresponsible and that he's gambling with this country's future? Yeah. I don't admit that at all. In fact, the gamble was to do nothing. The gamble yeah. was to stick on the, on the path that we were on and simply ra ra raise uh, spending and raise taxes and think somehow magically we were going to get to the promised land. That was not a credible path. This is. Nikki Aitkes. I certainly welcome the comprehensive growth plan that the Chancellor has outlined today. I particularly welcome the uh, reintroducing of tax-free shopping for international